to the Deep Dive Spirituality Conversations podcast. I'm your host, Brian Russell, and today I'm going to talk about reflections, and particularly spiritual, theological reflections on my own taken both an extended Sabbath time and sabbatical, as well as a long vacation. I'm still on my sabbatical, and I'm, in case you wonder what I'm up to, I'm actually working on a book on Exodus. It's going to be called Exodus and the Mission of God's Holy People. I'm also in preparation. Uh, that book will be out in a couple of years, probably. In 2024, I'm going to be releasing the Deep Dive Spirituality Transformational Journal. That'll be out sometime, hopefully uh, no later than early fall. I'm working on those things on while I'm on sabbatical. But recently, I returned home. Uh, my wife and I, we took a 19-day vacation to Italy and Greece. And this podcast isn't going to be some kind of travel log, so don't worry about that. But what I want to do is I want to break down some of the observations that I made about what it was like to be gone that long and specifically not working and what it's sort of an openness and curiosity mindset and posture allowed me to experience while I was there. I'm also going to start with some reflections on travel uh, from Seneca. Now, one of the things that I was a little disappointed about on my vacation is I really wanted to uh, find maybe a bust of Seneca, but it was funny in all the souvenir places, nobody even knew who Seneca was. But as uh, some of you may know, uh, Seneca's book, Letters from a Stoic, or more officially, it's the Moral Letters to Lucilius. These were letters that uh, the elderly, near the end of his life, uh, Seneca wrote to a younger man uh, whom he was mentoring. And letter uh, 28 is titled, On Travel as a Cure for Discontent. And I had Seneca's letter in mind before I went uh, to Europe. Um, I also had in mind my own previous experiences in different vacations. As if you've listened to this podcast for a long time, you know that I have talked from time to time about my own tendencies and struggles with uh, workaholism. And year, in years past, this hasn't been true recently, but up until just a year or so ago, I noticed whenever I would go on vacation, and these were usually short vacations, I would feel essentially terrible on the inside, like I should have been doing something else for three, sometimes even four days out of a one-week vacation and before I got to the point where I could actually relax enough to actually enjoy really the privilege of not having to work. And so I wanted to avoid that going into this 19-day vacation because uh, Again, trips to Europe aren't exactly cheap, and so this wasn't just some quick uh, kind of staycation type of thing. I wanted to be able to actually enjoy the vacation, and I just want to say, um, loved it. Loved every day. Now, of course, I was actually happy to come back to the United States after the end of end of my travels, but I had a great time. My wife and I had a, just a time of abundance together. Uh, we went to Italy first, got to check out Venice, went to Florence, saw the art museums, Took a day trip to Pisa, which was amazing, and I'll probably I'm going to come to the Pisa trip at some point, is uh, just to make a, a theological point. Also, then spent some time in Rome and got to see both the Roman era ruins of Rome, uh, as well as the the art in the Vatican, and and just experience a model uh, a modern bustling city. Took one day where we went south down to Salerno and then took a ferry to the Amalfi Coast, which is uh, just a real beautiful mountainous coastal area and got to experience a different side of Italy, a little smaller town experience. And then I jumped on a plane. Uh, and in two hours, we were in Athens, Greece, and literally back to the center of a, a part of the world that I've studied on and off since I was a kid. I've always been enamored with the Greeks, with their myth stories. Some of you know way before I um, I went to seminary, and as I have a PhD in biblical studies, so I, I know Greek and Hebrew, but what a lot of people don't know 
is uh, I had the privilege of studying classical Attic Greek, which was actually the Greek that was used in Athens during the classical period. I took three years of classical Greek at the University of Akron before I ever went to seminary. That was one of the best decisions I ever made because, uh, you know, it was hard. That was one of the hardest classes I ever took, classical Greek. But when I got to Asbury, um, without even, I mean, this isn't even a brag, um, reading the New Testament was like reading Dr. Seuss for me. And so that gave me a huge jump up. But the point is, I, I've been enamored with Greek literature for most of my life and have been able to even read it in the language. So it was just a joy uh, to go to Athens, let alone, and I will get to this at the very end, um, on my, I turned 55 while I was at, at, in Athens, and one of my birthday presents I wanted to give from, to myself was I wanted to stand on the Areopagus where Paul preached that famous sermon to, about an unknown God that's recorded in Acts 17, and I got to do that, and that was super fun. Now, that's my only indulgence today. Now, I want to jump in there. I want to start with Seneca. Now, of course, before I start reading from Seneca, if you find this episode helpful, I'd really love to get the word out on the show. If you're watching this on YouTube, would you consider liking this? Maybe share it with others. If you're listening and not subscribed, I'd love for you to be a subscriber if you find this helpful. Uh, maybe even leave a review. And I'm going to be mentioning a few resources. Of course, my own resources um, are in the show notes, but also have a link to uh, Seneca's book, Letters to a Stoic. Uh, that's a kind of a curated version. There's actually well over 100 total letters. I also have a link to a Kindle version where if you want to read all of the letters, you can uh, access them. It's a little different translation. I really like the Penguin Classic. If you just want to get a taste of Seneca, it has, I think, the key letters there because a lot of the letters tend to be repetitive. But those links will all be in the show notes. And if you want to support the show and you're not interested in the books, but you shop on Amazon, consider j click on one of the links. Obviously, it'll go to like Seneca or one of my books, but then go go buy whatever you actually want to buy on Amazon and a little residual uh, payment will come my way that doesn't affect the cost of your work as all. Well. Again, as always, if I can be helpful to you, feel free to reach out to me. I'm super easy. Uh, just brian at brianrussellphd.com. And at this point in my life, um, you know, I'm able to actually respond to emails myself, and I'm grateful for that. So if I could you know, help you, bless you, point you to some resource, feel free to reach out uh, to me. Now, without further ado, I want to start with uh, Seneca. In, less, in letter 28, uh, Seneca uh, writes this. Do you suppose that you alone have had this experience? Are you surprised, as it were, a novelty that after such long travel and so many changes of scenery, you have not been able to shake off the gloom and heaviness of your mind? You need a ch then he writes this list. You need a change of soul rather than a change of climate. Though you may cross vast spaces of sea, and though as Virgil, the great Roman writer, remarks, lands and cities are left astern, your faults will follow you wheresoever you travel. Socrates made the same remark to one who complained. He said, why do you wonder that globe trotting does not help you, seeing that you always take yourself with you? The reason which set you wandering is ever at your heels. What pleasure is there in seeing new lands or in surveying cities and spots of interest? All your bustle is useless. Do you ask why such flight does not help you? It is because you flee along with yourself. You must lay aside the burdens of the mind. Until you do this, no place will satisfy you. And skipping down just a little bit, this is the last paragraph I'll read. Um, you wander hither and yon to rid yourself of the burden that rests upon you, though it becomes more troublesome by reason of your own restlessness. Just as in a ship, the cargo, when stationary, makes no trouble, but when it shifts to the side or that, it causes the vessel to heal more quickly in the direction where it is settled. Anything you do tells against you, and you hurt yourself by your very unrest, for you're shaking up a sick man. Because yeah, sometimes travel is hard, and as I alluded to at the beginning, that used to be true for me. Taking time off was hard. 
that trouble once removed will become ple- uh, all change of scenery will become pleasant though you may be driven to the uttermost ends of the earth and whatever corner of a savage land you may find yourself that place however forbidding will be to you a hospital abode the person you mat you are matters more than the place to which you go for that reason we should not make the make the mind a bondsman to any one place Live in this belief. I'm not born for any one corner of the universe. This whole world is my country. And that's just a little taste of Seneca if you've never read him. I highly advise. And and I, I love that quotation and that whole little reflection because, because friends, the, the, the truth of the matter is if you travel, um, you're going to be, you're, the, the biggest problem is you end up taking yourself with you, right? And so one of the commitments that I made and, and my and my wife and I both made is, you know, we tend to be, we're both shy. Um, uh, we both like some continuity and, you know, we basically did something we've never done. Neither of us had ever traveled in Europe. I'd never been on a plane longer than five hours long, which would be a trip out to California. And um, I don't think my wife's been on a plane ride longer than, say, like three hours. And so we did this huge stretch doing these transatlantic flights. Matter of fact, the flight back from Athens was 12 hours just to get us to Atlanta. Then we had to fly the the rest of the way. Um, Also, you know, we're not really big city bustling types of people. And part of our trip to Europe was we were in really big cities. And so um, we committed essentially to being open open to adventure, curious, you know, we had a plan, but our plan was never like so tight fisted that if anything went wrong, it wasn't going to work. And one of the things that I went on vacation thinking was this, it's like, what would it be like for me to enjoy each moment fully? And I was wondering how much of each 19 days could just be full of joy, full of wonder, full of awe. And and I'm here back to not to report that like, hey, everything went absolutely perfect. But what I can actually say is um, I had an absolutely fantastic vacation uh, because I was content just being at my house before I left. So it was just literally gravy. I didn't go to Europe. People like, I think one of my, one of my friends, when I got back said, well, did you have a life-changing experience? The answer was no. Um, actually, I love my day in and day out life. And as I got to the end of 19 days, I mean, I, um, I, I, at some level, you wish a vacation would last forever. But I can honestly say is like, love the vacation, loved every minute of it. But I'm super excited to even like now be back. I'm finally over jet lag. It's about a week after I've gotten back when I'm recording this. And uh, uh, I'm just grateful to come back and reflect on those experiences, what they did to me spiritually, and to get back after uh, the work uh, that I love to do, spend time with my family and friends uh, back in the United States. Uh, so again, recommend that whole Seneca letter to you. And so let me talk about some reflections on this uh, again there's and, and i want to remind especially pastors and this this is true for everybody but I, I know a lot of my pastor friends and many of you are listening to this still struggle with taking just one day off a week uh, but i just want to say this there's power in not working now you know, I'm not going to sit here and say over 19 days, I never like, you know, just jumped in and checked my email because um, I did. But I can honestly say I did no work. I didn't do any of any professor work. I didn't do any writing. I didn't do any coaching. I didn't create any coaching tools other than make sure there wasn't literally somebody that absolutely needed to get in hold of me because I had no cell phone. Um, I did no work for 19 days. And what's fun about that is I'm 55 now. I started working. I actually started working as a soccer coach when I was 13 or 14. That was just kind of seasonal. But when I was 14 years old, in the fall when I was a freshman in high school, and I I was 14 for about six months, uh, I had a paper route. And for those of you who don't know this, that we had a, a weekly or daily paper in Akron, Ohio. It's still there. It's the Akron Beacon Journal. And I was a paper boy. So I literally delivered, I think, um, I think to 70 houses in, in my neighborhood. 
every single day. And I did that for four years. Now I had a couple breaks, but my point is basically since the fall of 1983, which is when I was in uh, ninth grade, up until now, there's never been a time ever that I didn't work for 19 straight days. Matter of fact, I think the record up until now would maybe have been maybe eight or nine over all of those years. Uh, and I don't want you to let that sink in. And, and so, you know, I did a, this breaking up this 19 days. It just it, it, this was a, that was the transformational experience for me. Because after a couple of days on vacation, I wasn't even thinking about my work. And then I still had a couple more weeks to do it. You know, did I miss some of my coaching clients? Sure. Um, did I miss friends? Sure. Um, but having that uncluttered space did a real gift for me. And so in one of those things was this, and this will sound funny, but I want you to really let this sink in. You know, when you stop working for a while, especially when you're gone. And I was essentially unreachable. You could get an email to me, but I only had email when I was in my hotel and here and there at a restaurant. Had no cell service in Europe. It was, I was cut off. But what I discovered, and, it, and I laughed when I thought about it, is it's this, this. You guess what? The world just get, gets, gets along fine without you. And if you're a pastor, it's true too. Your church will get along fine without you on those occasions where for the good of your own soul you're not working so there's real power in that and it also gives you clarity because one of the things that i noticed and i did have some time for some journaling on some of the train trips in between cities and in quiet moments at night when i would just kind of reflect on what i was seeing and some of this is in my notes that i'm going to share with you today but what what also helps you get clear on is when you get into a regular schedule that doesn't include time to step back, time to get away from your work, you tend to accumulate more and more work. And it just kind of piles up and your schedule gets more and more packed until you lose free space. And so what I was able to get clear on was what it parts of my work and vocation and calling and even some of my hobbies do I really miss and what parts of it have I not missed at all? And, and, and I'm just going to tell you the, the parts that I haven't missed at all, as much as I have control and there's a couple, there's always parts of, of our lives that you know we'd love to let go of, but as much as I have control over those things, they're not coming back into my life, the parts that I missed. This gets back to my done principle that I started this year. If my word for 2024 uh, 20, uh, is done, I'm done with dumb habits, obligations that don't align with my purpose, mission, and values. I'm done nurturing other people without first nurturing myself. And I'm done seeking external validation, right? Get away for 19 days or even a week or two weeks. Take consistent time off. And you can figure out what you're done with also. And what that does is it creates space. And instead of making your life small, your life gets big. So don't be afraid to take that extended time off. And yeah, my pastor friends, I'm really talking to you. But if you're an entrepreneur or just a person who works and works and works your whole life is work, step back, breathe, take a reflection. Right, the second thing that really struck me as I thought about my trip, it's just how, how wonderful the 21st century is to be alive. Now, yeah, I have seen the news, in case you wondered. And I know there's all kinds of bad stuff happening. But guess what? That's always been true. That's human nature and doesn't excuse it. But I know way too many people and myself and sometimes included in that, that worry way too much about politics, about what's going on in a particular denomination or somebody else's denomination, about the wars that are taking place. And instead of stepping back and just thinking like, wow, we there is no better time to ever be alive. Because I just want to tell you this, I got into a metal tube in Orlando with several hundred other people 
And you know what? There was zero problems in that airplane. And we got to go thousands of miles in a couple of hours. You know, or I don't know how many miles it was on the trip over, but I know that the plane from Athens back to Atlanta, it was 5,600 miles. And we did that in 12 hours. That's incredible. The other thing that was awesome about being in Italy and in Greece is, is there were people from all over the world, and I saw all the religions. Um, but, you know, and I don't know what everybody's religion was, but obviously some people's it's pretty easy to see. I saw um, people that are, I know I was a Christian, so there's at least one Christian in the in the in the crowd there. I saw Jewish people. I saw um, uh, Muslims. I saw. Um, Lots of Asian people, so presumably some of the Eastern religions were there. People from all over the world that were coming to look and and ponder and enjoy the same spaces. And again, guess what? Whatever the conflicts are in different parts of the world, I saw zero fights, tensions, arguments. I didn't hear anybody fighting about politics. It's amazing. It just reminds me that, uh, you know, you, you find what you're looking for. So I just want to say this from being away for a while, if all you find in your daily life are all the bad things that are happening and that's all you fixate on, I want to suggest take a step back, take some really deep breaths and look around and ponder how great the world actually is. Again, are there, is there work to be done? Absolutely. But don't miss the wonder of being alive right now and the opportunities that we have. It's amazing. Travel. I mean, I could send an email. I was able to email my kids, email my dad while I was there. If I would have spent more money, I could have even made a phone call from the other side. I did a WhatsApp call, which was free. I had a free call on WhatsApp through the internet. That's amazing. Grateful for that. Now I'm going to get into a little bit of heavier stuff. Um, eternal kingdoms. The thing that struck me the most, and this would have happened especially during my time in Rome and my time in Athens. Um, though you see this throughout Europe. If you live in the United States, you know there's a few old places. I've been to uh, San Juan, Puerto Rico, which um, there's the old part of... Um, um, San Juan, which was built when the Spanish came in, that's 500 years old approximately. You can go to St. Augustine, Florida, that's, I forget, four or 500 years old. There's a few older cities here and there and um, on the East Coast of the United States. Um, but you know, when you go to like Rome or any part of Europe, you see the medieval culture. And when you go to Rome in Athens, you see the vestiges of, of the Roman Empire, speak you know, that's across the Mediterranean, of course, but especially in Rome. You can still see some Roman stuff in Athens. But when you go to Athens, you even go back 500 years before the Roman Empire, and you see classical Greece, 5th century Athens. I'm going to talk about the influence of those places in just a couple minutes, but the thing that really struck me, and this hit me really um hard, especially when I was at Rome. That was our first place. And the day we went to the Colosseum and then got to walk through the Roman Forum. And it's literally rubble, right? And Rome was like the greatest empire that had ever been on the face of the planet. And it ruled a huge part of the globe. Uh, North Africa, Lots of uh, what is Europe now, a good chunk of Western Asia, and it's rubble. And those people thought that their kingdom was going to last forever. I'm guessing the Greeks thought their kingdom was going to last forever. Now it's rubble. And that was a reminder for me. It's like, you know, we think our way of life, you know, I'm an American. We think things are always going to go on like they, they have in our lifetime. And, and friends, at some point, everything's going to come to an end. Our lives are going to come to an end. And, I mean, 
and you can sit with that for a while, but go and looking at these places where the most powerful people on earth ruled and they're now literally rubble. And then as a Christian, I think of uh, the scriptures where it talks about, uh, you know, rule without end. His kingdom, he, the, the Exodus 15, 18, the Lord will reign forever and ever. The New Testament's vision of the eternal kingdom, that's what's eternal, that's what's permanent. So I felt inside, just like, what am I really living for? What's my life mean? Because someday I'm going to be dust too. That was a powerful lesson. Um, and I can just feel it when I was walking over those, you know, essentially the holy land of the classical world that's now just rubble. But it also reminded me there of the influence of these places. Uh, and again, I'm, I'm going to add tack on Rome. This next point is mostly going to be about Greece. Again, 5th century Athens. Uh, you know, you think of, when you think of, uh, of the influence of the Greeks, you think of the great uh, plays like tra the tragedies, like Oedipus Rex, the writings of uh, Sophocles. We think of Western philosophy, uh, you know, Socrates, the student Plato, Aristotle. The Stoics came out of, of, of Athens, you know. And, and what was really cool about this is, and, and what struck me was how small the actual Athenian Agora actually was. I'd always pictured this really big place, but classical Athens, it, it wasn't big. We're talking of tens of thousands of people that would have lived there. And the actual Agora, where a lot of the action was, um, it's what surprised me was only, it was acres. It wasn't like square miles. And yet, in this small space, you could have walked and you could have met Socrates. You could have met the cynic Diogenes, who was like, uh, you know, he lived in a barrel. <laughs> um, you could have, you know, Plato would have been running around learning from Socrates, Socrates' friends. You had people like Pericles, uh, Thucydides, uh, the playwrights. All of these people, you could have actually seen them. And they're in this small place. So you have philosophy. And this was like the, the roots of democracy. Um, also things as simple as uh, architecture. You know, I, I've always loved classical architecture. And, you know, in the Greeks... They gave to the world the column, right? And so they had there's and there's three kinds of columns. There was the Ionic, the Doric, and the Corinthian style. Romans added the Romans added the arch, but that's classical architecture, and that goes all the way back to the pre-Christ days. That that's incredible. So these this, this small town of Athens ended up essentially creating much of what became Western culture in creating the ideas of government that have actually influenced um, a lot of the Western world and, you know, especially influential in the United States. So I was really struck by that. So my takeaway also is this, again, given the smallness of Athens, it's just, it was just a small city state. Again, it was very powerful among the Greeks and they did have their own little empire, but a small place, a small number of people is that just reminds me, um, don't ever think that the work that you do doesn't matter, right? It could be small, but it could ultimately have the impact for millennia. Those writers from 5th century Athens, we still read them today. Some of the writers, like I read with Seneca. Seneca's a 1st century person, and we're reading his book almost 2,000 years after he died. That's incredible, right? So don't, the influence of Athens and Rome really struck me. Uh, loved going there. Now, you can't go to Europe without running into what I would call the relics of Christendom. You know what's Christendom? That's that that's that the, that whole period where essentially Christianity was the official religion. It was protected by the state, and that's the history of essentially Europe in many ways. And what was what's really cool is uh, I, I had to got was had the privilege of being in both um, Italy and 
Athens, Greece. And so I was able to see both Western style churches, the Roman influenced churches, and I was also able to see the Eastern Orthodox style of churches. Now in Venice, you had a little bit more Eastern flavor ex explicitly because Venice is extreme Northeast Italy. So it's actually really close. It's a lot closer to where the Eastern Orthodox church would have been. But what, what, I, what struck me, and you know, there's a joke that once you've been to Europe, um, you get um, you get cathedral fatigue. And it was, it's like you go around and uh, part of the city, you don't have to go too far because there'd been these parishes, just these absolutely gorgeous cathedrals. That was the story in the big cities in, in Rome that we went, just gorgeous, beautiful churches. And you go inside of these and they're almost like museums now. But what, what struck me and most of you who, if you know me, I'm a low church guy, I grew up a low church Methodist um, I've even been a house church person at different times, or organic church, everyone talked out. But one of the things that's really interesting is you go to these cathedrals is that they were undeniably beautiful. The cathedral at Pisa, for example, just, just gorgeous. And it took hundreds of years to, to construct these things. And when you walk inside, it's just awe-inducing with the beauty, the art, building shaped like the cross intentionally so everything has like a symbol and um, I have to say that um, I loved that and I just thought wow compared to the buildings that we do we have our communities of faith and we've really sort of lost something I almost felt like I was looking at a different religion than I actually practice loved it and then I got to Greece and got to go into some of the small Orthodox churches and they a Greek cross and if you don't know what a Greek cross looks like essentially it looks like a plus sign so instead of a Roman cross which again the cross beam is shorter than the than the the, the, the vertical beam um, the Greek cross is more like the plus sign and so the churches are shaped like that and they were incredibly gorgeous even the smallest ones they had icons in there art. And when you walk into these churches, I just felt a sense of awe, mystery, and beauty. And my takeaway, and again, I'm part of the missional church stuff. I've been involved in some of the emerging kind of conversations during my career, is I wonder uh, if we've lost some of that original mystery in the ways that we've kind of made our worship accessible and, and even relevant. You know, and again, this this will sound like a cheap shot. I don't really mean it this way, but a lot of times, um, when you walk into a, a way that we order most of our worship services, I, there's literally no difference than going to a nightclub or a rock concert. The way they're set up over against these Christendom churches, that seriously, I mean, when you're there, awe-inspiring, beautiful. So that was a takeaway, and I'm still not 100% sure what I'm going to do with that, but I wanted to name it. And if you haven't looked at Christian art, um, take a look at it. It'll, that'll expand your theological thinking. And one of the things, my, one of my takeaways I will say for sure is that I need to think more about um, my own, again, language, visuals, audio, all of the sensories, because these were multi-sensory worship experiences. And I think we've lost some of that. Let's talk about the brilliant audacity of Paul. Yeah, the, one of the things I was super pumped about was going to Athens, and uh, you know I love uh, Paul, and you know in my own work and, and as a biblical scholar, a lot of you know me as a centering prayer teacher and uh, even maybe as a coach, but. Um, you know, my core wheelhouse is I'm a professor of biblical studies, and, and, and my specialty is really a missional reading of the Bible. If you're watching this on YouTube, you can check out some of my playlists where I do some of these things. And you know, my book, Realigning with God, and my more popular uh, level book, Invitation, I kind of show how to read Scripture missionally. But one of the places that I've always looked for inspiration for what a missional reading looks like um, is Acts 17. You know, in Acts 17, Paul goes to Athens. Here's Paul, the former Pharisee, the uh, former just practicing uh, Jewish person, goes to Athens. And he um, goes through the city. And I just want to read a couple of verses here. 
it says why well, Paul was waiting for them, Paul's uh, his, his colleague Silas and Timothy. He's in Athens, and he was deeply distressed to see that the city was full of idols. <laughs> yeah, and there's, there's not a lot of idols left, but there's all kinds of temples. And so I was just imagining, especially when you go to the Agora, you can just see a lot of the relics and stuff that's there. And so it said he argued in the synagogues with the Jews and the devout persons, and also in the marketplace every day with those who stopped to be there or happen to be there. That would be the Agora, the marketplace. Also some Epicurean and Stoic philosophers. So he runs into those uh, that, those schools. And some said, what does this babbler want to say? Others says he seems to be a proclaimer of foreign divinities. This was because he was telling them about the good news of the resurrection. So they, so they took him and brought him to the Areopagus and asked him, may we know what this new teaching is that you are presenting? It sounds rather strange to us, so we would like to know what it means. Now all the Athenians and foreigners living there would spend their time in nothing but telling or hearing something new. And then it, then, then it goes on and Paul goes to the Areopagus. He's in front of it. And he, and he says, uh, um, I see how extremely religious you are. And if you know the story, you can kind of go on and read it yourself. Uh, Paul had found an altar to an unknown God because again they were kind of covering their bases and there's lots of gods in the ancient world. And Paul, as part of a sermon, basically says this, what therefore you worship is unknown, this I proclaim to you. And so when I say the brilliant audacity of Paul, you know, when I, I wanted to see the Areopagus, and I just always pictured it was just kind of a hill and that maybe there, that's part of the marketplace, but the Areopagus, friends, um, is it's like a rock it's just a big rock essentially it's very rocky I mean you can climb this thing there's steps getting pretty slippery it was really windy it was even raining when I was there um, and, and like I almost slipped off not off the whole thing but I almost slipped and hurt my ankle just when I was trying to move around to take some pictures but it was what it was is it, it's a rock that overlooks the Athenian Agora and what's really cool about it and I was just picturing Paul like what a place to preach this sermon it's a high point, so it's almost like a, and it's big, so it's like a, but it's like a natural pulp, but it would be kind of like if Paul was standing on top of like a, like a townhouse, like a row house. It's not a huge hill, but it's high enough that you can get above everything. And now what would be amazing is Paul would, if I'm facing in this video or if, if I'm facing you as a listener, you'd be in the Agora, kind of looking up, listening to Paul from the high ground, but directly over Paul's right shoulder would be the Acropolis in Athens. And if you know what the Acropolis is, uh, that is where the Parthenon is, and you had the temple to Athena, you had these amphitheaters, and the Acropolis towers over Athens. So here's Paul in his brilliant audacity with this testament, this monument to the goddess Athena right behind him, proclaiming Jesus using a point of contact that he found in Athens itself. I love that. And then it was also cool when he's saying, I can see you're religious. You know, when you're on the Areopagus, like to your left, like a little bit to the left and down into the Agora, there's this big temple. I can't remember if it was a temple to Poseidon. There were so many gods and temples over there. I forget what it was, but there's obviously a temple to another god or goddess directly kind of to Paul's left. So it's just all this stuff. Um, and Paul explained Jesus, not using scripture, though he's obviously teaching things that are in the scripture. He doesn't stand up and quote scripture like he would have done if he was in the synagogue. He finds the point of contact. There's this altar to an unknown God. And so Paul gives us this missional principle. Be so confident in the gospel that you can find something in the culture itself that gives you a starting point to introduce people to the God who's the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. The other thing is Paul was laughed at, scoffed at, but Paul was patient and he was persistent. And we know that some people actually listen to Paul. As Paul says in Corinthians, I become all things to all people so that by all possible means, I might save some. Paul's brilliant audacity, having the confidence in the gospel to share it 
in ways that let the people hear the gospel. And, and, and here's a question. I'll probably do a whole podcast or another video on this. And some of you have had me in class or heard me speak. I say this sometimes. It's this. What does a person have to be or become to hear the gospel from you? You know, when Paul was in Athens, you know what a person had to be or become? They just had to be a person who was open to worshiping the unknown God. Right? Sometimes we make it really tricky. People literally have to believe certain things before they can even hear about Jesus from us or have to dress a certain way. For Paul, he just found that point of contact in the culture. Paul entered their culture to share the good news with them. Loved it. It was so powerful just to see that story come to life and to stand basically somewhere in the vicinity where Paul actually preached that sermon. Those of you who've been to like the Holy Land have had that similar experience, but there is something about traveling to these places that really gives you a sense of what was really going on that, and it brings the text to life. Now, I would like to share a couple of heart strangely warm moments, and you know, I just shared one of them. I loved that day when I got to imagine what Paul was doing, and I literally felt my heart just kind of burn. You know, who's God? Who's God? put in my life that I can reach? And do I love those people enough to do what Paul did, find that point of contact? Um, again, I love the Roman Forum. That goes back to the eternal kingdom. That was like, I think that was my first heart strangely warmed moment that I had on, on the vacation. Um, and then when I was in the Vatican, we were heading towards the Sistine Chapel, which, again, spectacular, but kind of knew what to expect there. Um, we took a little detour, and there was a section where the great uh, Renaissance painter Raphael had some works there. And, you know, and I, and I, wasn't, I thought, I like Raphael. So I'm going through the rooms, and we go into this space that were, where um, the Pope had used, I think, as a former way, place where he could meet people. And uh, and I turn around and literally, there was my favorite work of art ever. It was Raphael's School of Athens. I have a poster-sized version of this. And, and what was powerful about this for me is like I'm literally staring at something that I've loved for a, over 20. Actually, I've loved this painting, I think, since I saw it in the early, in the 1980s when I was in college. You don't know the School of Athens. It has Plato and Aristotle, um, and it has all the famous figures from Athens there. And and uh, Raphael used characters, so like Leonardo da Vinci is Plato, for example. So he just painted what Athens would have been like using contemporary figures. And what struck me and what really warmed my heart, not just seeing this beautiful work of art, but what I didn't realize was how big it was. This wasn't a painting. This was literally an entire wall. It was a fresco, I guess you'd call it. It's the size of a billboard. And I'm looking at this and I'm thinking, my gosh, how grateful I am. I'm looking at something that was painted over 500 years ago. And I get to enjoy it. And I, was, and I just was grateful and filled with the a love for creativity and a gratitude to God. And what was also cool is in the room then, the opposite side of the School of Athens was another painting that showed the best of Christendom and had the Lord Jesus there and some other Christian symbols. So it was just kind of all fused together. So it was just a powerful moment. Now I could share other great things. I think um, as far as my favorite days, I, I like the quieter days. If you, you know, if you ever go into Italy, um, again, I would recommend going when we did. It was still really busy, but it, it, it wasn't uh, super hot yet, and it was not tour season, so we waited until Easter was, um, was over and then went there, and so we were there in April, great time. But uh, I loved Pisa, a little quieter and just gorgeous, and, and it wasn't just about the tower. I got to see the Leaning Tower. I even got to go up it, but uh, just loved the smaller town. We got a, it wasn't so touristy. We got to walk around and you know eat at some normal restaurants. And also, I would say, if you ever have a chance to go south, like the Salerno, Naples, uh, the Amalfi Coast area, beautiful, a little less hectic there if you're more of a, um, not so much of a high-density urban kind of a person. But again, wanted to share these with you. I hope you found this stuff helpful, and this doesn't just sound like Brian's travel log. I wanted to do some takeaways and breakdowns. And, and the biggest thing is, is this, take 
some time to step back from your life. And then have the courage also then to be self-reflective of it. You know, I had a spectacular trip and I did all the touristy stuff, obviously, at some level too. Um, but I use this to be open to being transformed. And I hope Seneca would be proud there because, you know what, uh, the problem with me going on vacation wasn't that I went along because uh, I went on vacation just to be open to an experience. And I was happy living in Orlando, happy to be back in Orlando. But I was really happy for the privilege of my, of my wife and I taking, again, this is a postponed trip from 2020. Uh, so just a, a, a great opportunity to see some of the world that I'd never experienced. Uh, thank you for listening. And again, if I can be of any service to you, reach out to me. Again, check out the show notes. Check out my website, brianrussellphd.com. And until next time, live by faith, be known by love, and be a voice of hope to others.